Now that we've studied the local spin density approximation and generalized gradient and meta-generalized gradient approximations, I want to spend some time looking at hybrid functionals, which derive from making the adiabatic connection approximation. So what's, what's adiabatic connection? Well, adiabatic connection models are developed by thinking about turning on the electron-electron interaction in the cone-sham formalism. That is, we begin with a non-interacting system and thinking about a smooth way to convert from the non-interacting system to the fully interacting system. And so if you like, the exchange correlation energy can be in computed as an integral over some coupling parameter lambda where when lambda is zero, so the lower limit of integration, we have no interelectronic interaction. So that is the non-interacting hypothetical cone sham system. And when lambda reaches one, we've got the exact system. So given that means for computing the exchange correlation energy, let's, let's think about what that really means. Well, if we sit at point zero on the integral, the non-interacting limit, then the only component of this exchange correlation potential is the exchange component, because we have an anti-symmetric wave function. And that's, you know, you just get exchange out of the anti-symmetry. The Slater determinant of the cone sham orbitals that defines this psi is the exact wave function for the non-interacting Hamiltonian. And so we could compute the expectation value of the exact exchange for the non-interacting system, just the way we do it in Hartree-Fock theory, except we'll be using these cone sham orbitals. So that's pretty straightforward. And on the next slide, I'm going I'm to show a graphical picture. And uh, the area of the rectangle, I guess we'll look at the slide and we'll see that rectangle in a moment, that you can, th all integrals in a sense are areas under a curve. So I want to think about this integral not as an abstract thing, but actually think about it as uh, something that we would generate geometrically. So here, let's, let's look at this curve for a second. Down here on the uh, abscissa is lambda. So this is the integral that's running from 0 to 1. And here's what we're integrating. We're turning on this coupling parameter for the non-interacting wave function at 0 going to the fully interacting uh, wave function at 1. And so if I think of this as being the actual curve that's associated with this function in here. So somehow as I'm turning on coupling, this curve rises. Well, at this point, what I was saying before is for the fully non-interacting system, that is for lambda equals zero, the only component that's in here is the exchange energy associated with anti-symmetry evaluated for that non-interacting wave function. That's the cone sham wave function. And so if I were just to extend a line across here, well, it has, it has uh, height, I guess we'll call it, of psi zero k psi zero, that's the Hartree-Fock ener exchange energy, and it has length of one, and so the net area for this rectangle right here is the Hartree-Fock exchange energy. What I want, the value of this integral is the whole area under this curve, so what I want to find, actually, is this piece in here, right? So I've got Hartree-Fock exchange energy, and I must need to add something else in order to get the uh, sum of these two, which is the integral. And that's what I want. I want the integral. Okay, well, that area that we want is actually some fraction, I'll call it z, of the area of a rectangle above, which itself has this area. It's the expectation value of the exact exchange correlation operator on the exact wave function minus the piece of the rectangle we already know about. Okay, so let me again try to make that clear with the picture. If I come over to this top end, the end of the integration, so lambda's at one, and I've got some expectation value I can compute for the fully interacting system, Again, if I just extend this across as a line, the area under the rectangle will be this height times a width of 1, so it'll be this value. Of course, it contains within it the Hartree-Fock exchange energy, so this top rectangle here would be gotten by subtracting this rectangle, the Hartree-Fock exchange energy, 
from this value times 1 to get an area. So I want to know that this fraction, basically. So I don't know what z is. I could take it as an empirical parameter to be optimized. So if the curve looks a lot like this, z would be close to 1. If the curve looks kind of like this, z might actually be much closer to 0. If the curve is a straight line, well, then I know that z is equal to a half, right? I'll have cut my rectangle in half. But in any case, z is something that I have to try to figure out, potentially. But what should I take that uppermost right endpoint to be? Well, I'll just take some density functional, and I'll compute the exchange correlation energy for the cone sham orbitals. And that means that the area of the total rectangle is the exchange correlation energy. So when I take and I want to get the total area under the curve, it'll be the bottom rectangle, which is the hartree fock exchange energy, plus the fraction of the big rectangle minus the bottom rectangle to avoid double counting that. So again, I'll just try to show that geometrically. It's this plus a piece of all of this minus this. Okay, well, I'll just repeat that equation here. Conventionally, we don't actually use the variable z. We define a to be 1 minus z, and that just lets us write it a little bit differently. And we come up with uh, the exchange correlation energy is 1 minus a times the DFT exchange correlation plus a times the hartree fock exchange. So this is the adiabatic connection method because it connects between non-interacting and fully interacting states. And functionally what it does is it adds a percentage of exact hartree fock exchange to the DFT exchange and correlation in this case. Uh, this will come at a cost because to solve hartree fock exchange you've got to do four index integrals, but it, uh, well we'll see, it has the potential to improve things. Now as I mentioned, if the expectation value of the curve is a line, then z is 0 0.5. So that was a method first explored by Becky, and he called it a half and half method. So using LDA for the exchange correlation component, in 93, Becky showed that the half and half method had an error of 6.4 kcals per mole for the enthalpy of formation of a test set called the G1 test set of molecules. And that was a pretty good result in those days. It takes pretty heroic post hartree fock models to get down to errors substantially smaller than 6. Now, uh, you don't have to just make an arbitrary estimate of z or a. z is equal to a if uh, it's 0 0.5. But you could uh, potentially do a little better than this. And in, also in 1993, Becky made the following proposal. He took the his exchange functional, Becky exchange, which derives from adding a generalized gradient correction to the local spin density approximation, and he added to that the Purdue-Wang 91 correlation functional, which also adds something to the uh, local spin density approximation, and he optimized three parameters. So he said, okay, for the exchange, I'm going to follow adiabatic connection and I'll put in a certain percentage of hartree fock to replace a certain percentage of LSDA. And then I will add the generalized gradient approximation correction, but I'll actually scale that a bit with a value B. And similarly, I will scale the GGA correction to the LSDA correlation energy. And he optimized these values of A, B, and C on a large test set. The values he came up with were 0.2, so that's 20% hartree fock exchange. 0.72, so scaling back the GGA correction by 28%, and scaling back the correlation correction by 19%. So he gave it the name B3PW91, so Becky 3 parameter, Purdue Wang 91, and uh, it's called a hybrid functional because it includes some exact hartree fock exchange. So subsequently, Stevens and co-workers, and one of those co-workers was Mike Frisch, who is uh, the chief developer of the Gaussian code that we've been using for problem sets. 
decided that they would use the LYP correlation functional instead of the PW91 correlation functional. And at the time, uh, so Mike Frisch, I've heard him talk about this, and he figured that if these parameters, 0 0.2, 0 0.72, and 0 0.81, were of any general value, it shouldn't really matter so much what the uh, individual functionals were. And so he just employed them directly. He took exactly the same numbers, but he employed them in the context of LYP as the correlation functional. And that introduces a slight wrinkle because LYP does not add a gradient correction to LSDA. Instead, it uh, simply replaces LSDA. It's designed to compute the entire correlation energy. So in this case, it's not LSDA plus a scaled LYP, but instead we treat it just the way we do exchange. There's a certain percentage of Hartree Fock exchange, there's a certain percentage of generalized gradient compared to LSDA. And he called that, uh, the, those coworkers, Stevens and coworkers, called it B3LYP. Of all modern functionals to date, B3LYP has proven most popular, although, as I note here, its reign seems to be ending. Of course, uh, whether through professional jealousy or what have you, uh, B3LYP has become the functional that professional theorists love to hate, in part because uh, many people adopt it simply in, in sort of a herd mentality. It seems like everybody's using it, so perhaps I should use it too. Uh, of course, a, a better approach would be to say, I've seen other people use it on similar problems, and it seems to have worked, and that's why that's, it seems to have worked and that's why I picked it. If someone says that to me, I, I have reasonable respect. That's a good way to pick functionals to see if they've worked in similar systems. But in any case, that's more a inside baseball uh, cattiness about B3LYP. Adiabatic connection methods in general, hybrid methods, even though they have this end of the fourth scaling, are often methods of choice in terms of maximizing accuracy. So uh, this idea then that we've approached, so here we've got this original cone sham theory which said we're going to have a kinetic energy term, a nuclear electronic attraction, an electronic electronic repulsion, and then an exchange and correlation fix for the non-interacting system. Uh, now we're going to uh, compare this to Hartree-Fock theory which says there's a kinetic energy and there's a nuclear electron attraction and there's an electron electron repulsion and we've got Hartree-Fock exchange, where it cancels the self-interaction in EE. And so Becky's contribution, in a sense, when looking at these kind of eigenvalue equations, was to simply generalize things and say, I've still got these three terms, but now I'm going to take a mixture of the Hartree-Fock term and of the density functional term. And this was the original paper. Of course, then he went on to consider uh, uh, some parametric expansions of this, but that 2013 paper, when I checked it yesterday, has 39,000 plus citations. So its impact on chemistry really cannot be overemphasized, uh, and it, it certainly is a tribute to Becky's insight that he has earned uh, so, so much attention for that work. And this is just emphasizing that there is a relationship between all of these one electron operators. In some sense, one can think of Hartree-Fock theory and original cone sham theory and hybrid theory as just points on a continuum of kinds of one electron operators to solve pseudo eigenvalue equations. So uh, I keep saying it, it worked really well. Let's actually look at some numbers. Hybrid DFT was quite a breakthrough. These are the numbers we've been seeing throughout these lectures. And the last set we looked at, the generalized gradient approximations with BLYP, we'd gotten the bond energies down to an average error of 1.5 kcals per mole and the barrier heights to a 8 kcals per mole. So the hybrid approach has now gotten to chemical accuracy, so below 1 kcal per mole in bond energies, and it's brought the barrier heights down by a factor of 2. So 4 kcals per mole is still a little uh, less than we'd like, but we are paying effectively Hartree-Fock cost because we've got a little Hartree-Fock exchange and we're achieving accuracy that otherwise would require much more expensive post-Hartree-Fock models. And uh, this slide was actually borrowed from Don Trular and he says this was basically the tipping point. Once, once this appeared, DFT became the accepted everyday tool for uh, molecular modeling purposes. Some proof of the popularity of B3LYP, and I'll come back to the cattiness of why theorists hate it, because uh, 
This review in 2007 in the Journal of Physical Chemistry A by these authors uh, just did a survey of the literature of what had people used up to that point to do calculations. And 80% of all density functional theory calculations in the literature to that point used B3LYP, which is you know, sort of a remarkable testament to how quickly that model took off. Of course, it helped that it was coded in some popular quantum chemistry programs, but uh, there was a synergy there. Uh, the remaining use use of functionals was scattered here and there, but uh, B3LYP was certainly the dominant functional. So uh, we're going to end with that, and in the final video, we will take a look at coming right up to the present in density functional theory.